Hi folks, I'm Ted Green. I'm the founder member of the Ancient Tree Forum in the UK. And it's a group of people which are actually very passionate about all aspects of old trees. But when you talk about old trees, old trees were always in the past working trees. Every tree that survives today that is old actually had to work for its living. And this first picture shows you a scene which could have been taken 7,000 years ago or 7 minutes ago because it is really agroforestry. We call it wood pasture but the two are synonymous. Man started in wood pasture, this great savanna of, of land across Europe which wasn't dense forest. So if you like, wood pasture then became agroforestry. So the two run together and it's so important. Cows, animals, trees, working trees. Every tree has to work for a living. The next picture is showing you actually an old oak pollard which came out of a river in Britain and it's been carbon dated 3,400 years ago. And it's a pollard, in Britain we call them pollards, where the top is cut, and it's, it was cut by man 3,400 years ago. And this is showing you one we found recently in a small wood in Britain, exactly the same again. There's no difference. So history, that side of history was perpetuated down the centuries. Nothing really changed. The trees were grown and selected for what their uses were and they carried on being done right up to almost to the present day. And this is from the, the Meurs between Belgium and Holland and two or three of those trees there we can tell were cut by man before they finished up in the mud of the river and they are 18,000 years old. These trees are in Normandy, they look very similar to the ones that came out of the Meurs and the small branches on the side were cut or are cut still on a regular basis and presumably they're either cut for starting fires or it's tree hay. Cutting branches with leaves on in the summer and using them in the winter for tree hay. It's a fascinating story. This picture shows you uh, a wooden tool which is 6,000 years old. It's got flints in the blade and look how similar it looks to a modern day saw. The people that found it, the archaeologists, say it was for cutting cereals and hay. But what's that knob doing? The knob reminds me and the whole picture reminds me of a saw. They were cutting branches. Here are some sheep which have found a fallen limb and they go straight in and eat the vegetation. This is where I think man got the idea of tree hay. And there's one of my old friends, there she is into it, we call it salex, a salex bush. And she's found, got her neck over the branch, pulled it down and she's eating it. And in this case, I think the sallow is for medicine. She is self-medicating. Fascinating. That instinct is still there. And here, this is in Scotland, and you can see the ring of stones, which is where they kept the animals in the winter or at night. But the two trees are salix, and they're two pollards. And I'm sure the shepherds of that day knew that those trees would, well, be, could be used for medicine for the animals. And this is us starting new experiments or trying to relearn or reinvent the wheel again in the UK. And this is a Fraxinus and we've cut some and hung them up to dry as we thought was a traditional way of doing it. And there they are on a, on a, a horizontal limb and they're going to be left to dry and put into bundles. What we did was, in fact, we learned that don't leave them there too long and they should be in a tight bundle. And of course, any farmer will tell you, when you store hay, it has to be very tight. So we've got it wrong. There we are, feeding the Exmoor ponies in the winter. And there you go, the cows have found it. And they can't wait to get in to, to feed on these, we call them faggots in Britain. 
cows again eating them. And if you look at that, that, that those cut branches there are probably six, seven months old. And as you can see, some of them are still green. They've retained the green greenness. This is an area where I'd like to explore. It shows some green islands on the leaf. And these green islands are caused, in this case, by a disease. And what the disease does during its life cycle, it actually inhibits the tree's manufacturing minerals and nutrients and sugars. But it inhibits them, uh, allowing the tree to take them back to itself. It stores them in these green islands. So in actual fact, at the end of the year, when the, the tree starts to withdraw all its resources, autumn, uh, the fungus stops it happening. And these minerals and nutrients and trace elements are trapped in those green islands. There you go. There's a cow. You can actually see her tongue. And she's seeking out these, these leaves on the ground with green islands. That's instinct. That goes right back to day one. And we're missing a trick because what's in those minerals and what's trapped in those trace elements? Are they a fundamental part of, a, of a, an animal's diet which we've taken away? Or we can restore, of course. And there's a selection of different species of leaves showing the, um, the green islands. This picture is in Norway of some pollard trees where there's been a bit experiment on pollard trees in a herbridge meadow a herbridge meadow without pollard trees and an, Im and an improved grassland and they looked at the, the, the nutrient values of those three sites and the best one was of course the one with the pollard trees on because presumably the years that the trees aren't being pollard in they are producing leaves which go down into the ground, get recycled in the mineral and nutrient recycling. Here we're starting to start to make new pollards. We think it's an essential part of their cultural history, which has been lost or being lost throughout Europe is cutting trees for whatever resource we need and when Britain, as I say, we call them pollards. So, generally speaking, we want to cut them when probably they're the diameter of your thumb. But, and, and you can cut them straight across or you can cut them where there's a fork to get what we call in Britain a bolling or the beginnings of a bolling. This is maybe the third cut it's all fraxinous at the moment, you're seeing. And, and look at the wood you can, you can get from that, that bowling, or that, where that fist is. Here we are where they're, they're really striking, we call it striking. They're flashing again, and there's a lot of, lot of new growth on those trees. And this is probably done on a three or four year rotation, depending on what the, what the use is for. Hi folks, uh, I'm with Alan who's been managing some lovely ash, ash trees and created a lot of pollard and the, the, the cuts are being used to make tree hay but I'd love to introduce Alan and get him to talk about how he's done them. Alan. So we uh, climbed up as high as we could and we used uh, an axe uh, just to cut it just above any points, growth points, any splits and they, they seem to have worked really well. Especially these young ones have gone really well, haven't they? Yeah, for the second time. So these have been cut twice. If you could start with one about the diameter of, say, a broom handle, because we know that all the wood is sapwood, and the actual sapwood around the ring calluses over. But as Alan's pointed out, he's done them much, much older. And this one, uh, maybe the second time, and we're going to look at another tree in a minute where it's probably anything up to 20 centimetres. But we are talking about ash, and we're never sure really about some of the other trees. So we're specific on ash. But I think the essence of this was for me was it was done with an axe because that's what the old boys would have used. 
is a tree which is probably by its girth just about the limit for when you wanted to start cutting but what Alan has actually done he's cut the tree to the, to the fork meaning that he's gone up the two limbs the two fork the fork and cut uh, three limbs you can't see one and the maximum of about 19 to 20 centimeters the tree was then successfully successfully in the fact that he put on lots of stems and he's gone up another meter to two meters and cut the tree again so in other words if we want we want tree fodder now we've got to go to that first that last two meters above the last pollen so i probably would not try to do another pollen on it because it's getting very high and we've got to think about the practical side of doing these things but it's a, a brilliant tree and a brilliant example of, of what, what people can do to get tree hay and equally at the same time at some stage he's going to get some limbs of a decent size which he can use for all sorts of things fence posts wood fuel anything so he's, he's getting more than one use from this tree Alan this is one of the best examples I've ever seen of what we call today restoration pollarding or conservation pollarding because it's a massive old ash tree which is well out of the rotation which it would have been in can, can you can you just describe what they actually did here because it's absolutely brilliant yeah, it was a lovely old pollard and it was so old it was starting to pull itself apart and we got the tree surgeon to take the weight off of it, those long branches and it's now sprouted and it's survived we did that about five years ago wow. so a serious serious example of what we want how we want to manage our old trees this is this is cultural history it's, it's a landscape tree yes but it's so much part of their culture it dates right back right back to early man We're just going to try and feed these these cows with some almas. I mean, it's it's a bit early in the year to use it, but it's a, just an illustration of what what they love. In fact, it's interesting. At the moment, one of them doesn't know what to do with it. But if I move up to these two individuals, they're going mad. So there you go. Now this is the sort of thing which would have happened in the Mediterranean, would happen in the Mediterranean, because in the Mediterranean there's less green vegetation in the summer. Whereas what we would do in the northern hemisphere is cut this, dry it, and use it in the winter when we haven't got much green vegetation. got two uh, what we call faggots in Britain and uh, branches we cut mainly for ash, uh, fraxinus uh, and almus and I think we've even used prunus and um, coriolis, coriolis so there's a whole mixture of, of twigs we've got in here and they, these were cut in July last year and in a similar fashion to why the, when you cut hay, you try and cut hay when all the nutrients and minerals and everything is up in the leaf and so you cut it and trap them in and the same applies to these and what's interesting about these, these this is now seven or eight months on and they still smell nice. This is what gets me, it intrigues me that we by trapping them in we've actually also trapped in the smell. The tree smoke, some of it eight, nine months after and cut it, is still green. To me, it's almost like a feeding frenzy, and as if they've never eaten real food before. They're absolutely one, one or two just haven't learned yet, but the rest are absolutely 
young man. And again, interestingly, because they're more interested in this dried material than they were in the fresh, which we gave them a few seconds ago. And two of them in particular absolutely love it. But they still got that hereditary gin bag. And sustainability to me means agroforestry and wood pasture, of course. I've got to, I can't split the two. But it's a system which has probably been in practice since man stood up. And the one thing that it does provide is a biological continuity. Because very little of it's changed. It's basically the same animals. It's man's changed a bit, but it's the same. The whole system is basically the same. We may think we've improved upon it, but in actual fact, it's still sustainable. <laughs>